okay, so um, the, the last thing I covered when I left um, uh, for the hospital was this um, property of Gaussians. If you have two Gaussians, two univariate Gaussians, okay, if you have sort of the picture is if you have a Gaussian in one side and a Gaussian on the other side and you multiply them you will get a 2D Gaussian. <coughs> and here is um, how, and I went over this proof but basically it goes as follows. The probability of x1 and x2 is equal to probability of x1 times the probability of x2. The reason why I'm factoring them as a product is because I've said that they're independent. Univariate just means one dimension. Multivariate means multiple dimensions. In this case, it's two dimensions, so actually I could have used the word bivariate. And then when I write all each of these, I will write the expression for each probability. So this one is 2 pi sigma 1 so sigma squared to the minus a half. So this is just the expression of a 1D Gaussian. Times 2 pi sigma squared minus a half e to the minus 1 over 2 sigma squared times x2 minus mu 2 squared. If I group terms, and the details of higher group terms, they're already uploaded on the website in the lectures and uh, the, what I did last time. Um, I'm just going to get down to the conclusion. If I group terms, I will get 2 pi sigma squared to the minus 2 over 2. The reason why it's minus 2 over 2 is because I'm multiplying this guy times this guy. So I have two of them. I have two of them. And then when I multiply this other guy, I will get e to the minus a half and then I will have a vector x minus mu 1 x 2 minus mu 2 times a matrix which will be sigma squared 0 0 sigma squared inverse times a vector x1 minus mu 1 x2 minus mu 2 okay that's all inside sort of all in the exponent This, I will, especially because you need to study for the midterm, the solution is already on the website. But I do recommend that you try to go from here to here to practice. In other words, I'm going to say that this is equal to two, the determinant of 2 pi sigma to the minus a half e to the minus <coughs> x1 minus mu1, sorry, x1 minus mu. Uh, that's not what I want to say. <coughs> what I want to say is I'm going to introduce vectors x minus mu. Transpose sigma minus 1 times x minus mu. So that's the formula for a multivariate gas where my sigma is just equal to sigma squared 0, yeah. sigma squared and 0, 
my mu vector is equal to mu1 and mu2 and my x vector is equal to x1 and x2 okay so one question that was asked one question that I and, and then you can check that the determinant of sigma If I have the expression 2 pi sigma, the, oops, sigma, 2 pi sigma to the minus a half, that's equal to the determinant of 2 pi times the matrix sigma, which is sigma squared times sigma squared 0, 0 to the minus a half. A property of determinants is if you have a constant times a determinant and if A is 2 by 2 then this is just equal to C squared times A. Right, because if you multiply 2 pi times A you would have to multiply this 2 pi would have to multiply this and would have to multiply this and when you compute the determinant which is you multiply the diagonal the 2 pi is being multiplied twice. So we have 2 pi to the minus 2 over 2, which is just minus 1, times sigma squared to the minus 2 over 2, which is what we had, which is how I went from here to here. Do you have uh, to the minus a half, to the minus 2 over 2? Because that's what we call it before. Uh, there's 2 pi sigma squared. So look at the last line and say 2 pi sigma squared determinant 2 minus a half. Yeah. But the 2 pi is inside a determinant. So this is also equal to 2 pi minus 1 sigma minus a half e to the minus a half x minus mu transpose sigma minus y x minus mu. I'm using the property okay let's do this with a 2 by 2 matrix Let's say that A is a matrix that has this form. Okay. So, what's the determinant of A? Six, right? Okay. So now, let's consider the matrix three times A, which will be equal to three times. 2003. The determinant of, and so it's equal to 2 times 3. Actually, let's make this 4 so that so that they so it's clear. So it will be 4 times 2, 0, 0, and then 4 times 3. And so the determinant is 4 times 2 plus, sorry, 4 times 2 times 4 times 3, which is equal to 4 squared times 2 times 3, which is equal to 4 squared times the determinant of A. So if you have a constant and you take the determinant, that constant takes the power of the size of the matrix. That's essentially what's happened here. The matrix is 2 by 2, so this constant then gets the power 2. And it sort of makes sense because that constant multiplies all the entries. There, therefore, it should acquire that power. That's why I often write it like this or like that. 
I prefer to write it like this because I am, uh, you've probably figured it out by now, I love compact notation. And my course, most of it is about notation. And really notation is the big barrier to get into machine learning. Once you understand notation and you're out there in industry, you can download any software. But if you want to modify the software, you want to read a paper, you just need to understand the notation of the paper and you'll, you'll have the concepts, you'll have no trouble. But you need to go past the notation barrier. Okay, so, so this basically just illustrates one thing, is that if you have univariate Gaussians and you multiply them, we still get a Gaussian that has the form of a multivariate Gaussian. And then the mean vector is the mean of each of the individual Gaussians, and then if they are independent, the covariance is just a diagonal matrix, which is your sigma squared times the identity. Right, because this is basically, can also be written as sigma squared times the identity matrix of size two by two. And that's what happens in linear regression. Question? This presumes that the variance is the same. That's, the variance being the same has nothing really to do with them being independent. They could be independent and have different variants, in which case you would just get yes. values. Yes. They could be independent with different variances. And that's possible that each point has a different variance. And I leave it as an exercise for you to find the maximum likelihood there when each point has a different variance. It turns out that it's not hard. No, in fact, it's just changing the sigma at the end to the covariance. The, the key here is that the covariance means that all the others off the day are zero. In previous midterms, I have asked that as a question. It, again, you compute the derivative with respect to each sigma, you equate to zero, and there goes your solution. The procedure is always the same. If you do that, you have to be given a data. Is that correct? That's correct. So you can't. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to come to all this soon. Okay. So let me go ahead. Sure. Um, now, <coughs> let's look at an example of what I mean by learning in maximum likelihood. What I mean by learning a Gauss. This is the simplest possible example I can construct as to how to learn from a, you know how to learn from coin flips. You just count how many ones and divide by the total number of coin flips. Now I'm gonna tell you how to learn if you have a Gauss. And we're gonna assume that we have data and we're gonna assume we have three data points. One, 0 0.5 or 1.5. So we're not doing regression. This is just, you just seen three points. And you now want to estimate, you want to fit a Gaussian to these points. Okay, that's the game that we're going to play. And to make the problem even easier, I'm going to say the variance of that Gaussian will be one. So we don't need to worry about the variance. We set it to one. But we need to figure out what should be the mean of that Gaussian. So intuitively, if it's one in 0.5 and 1.5, you wouldn't expect the mean to be 100 or 300 or, uh, you expect the mean is somewhere in between ballpark one, around there, okay? And if you can't work it out automatically, what we can do is we can use, take the derivatives equate to zero and that will give us the solution that we want. If we have three points and they're independent Gaussian, so each point Y has a mean theta and has a variance one, so we just say that y is distributed from a Gaussian with mean theta variance one. What I've done here is I took the mean out, right? Because if I have, let's assume that I have a signal that looks like this. So this is at theta. If I have a signal that looks like that, I can write it as, um, what do I mean? Uh, what I want to say is, if you have something that is 2, plus or minus 0 0.1, I'm trying plus to think of, 
yeah, this is the oscillation around the value of theta. But if theta is the mean, it means that theta is also the center. So I can write it in this other form. So the two are equivalent. Um, so the mean I can take out. Um, so there's two equivalent ways of saying that what I'm saying is y, y will be centered at theta and it will have some oscillation about theta. In this case there's only three y's. If they're independent that means that I can write the joint as the product of the three uh, marginals. And now let's ask the question which is the theta that is the maximum likelihood theta? By that what I mean is the following. Let's plot uh, 0.5, 1, 1 1.5. So I have here what, whoops, unfortunately, y2, y3, so this is y. And I'm going to plot p of y given uh, actually just p of y given theta and I'm going to choose theta to be equal to 2. So this is 0 0.5, this is 1, this is 1.5, this is 2. p of y given theta is a Gaussian distribution Let's say that I put a Gaussian center at 2. So if my mean is theta 2, then the probabilities The probabilities will be basically is essentially the height by definition at that point. Okay. The probability density is just going to be the Gaussian evaluated at those three points. If on the other hand I <coughs> I look at P of Y when a Gaussian that has mean equal to 0 point, mean equal to 1, say, my drawings are really poor so they're not helping. Hopefully you'll get intuition, if not I'll redraw. Oops. If I consider a Gaussian that ha is centered at the mean, then the height of the green bars, and each green bar is a probability, so this would be the P of y2 given theta equal 1. This bar would be P of y3 given theta equal to um, 1 and so on. If I multiply those three green bars, I'm going to get a bigger number than if I multiply these three green bars. And that's what higher likelihood means. Just it has higher probability. Okay, so I'm just multiplying those three probabilities. Finding something that has higher likelihood is I'm basically moving a Gaussian I'm moving a Gaussian left and right until that Gaussian is likely to tell me how likely it is that the points um, have been generated by that model.
So let's assume I have a computer. An easy assumption these days. Uh, provided you don't live in New York and are out of power. <laughs> um, and if you're not in that sad situation, then you have access to a random number generator. Okay? So if you have a random number generator, you can generate a bunch of numbers, Gaussian variables between 0 and 1 quite easily. Okay? So all code, I'm not going to go into how you do that, how computers do that. Um, I discussed that in 540. But computers can generate Gaussian, you just call RAND, and it generates a bunch of random numbers that are Gaussian distributed. So in particular, if you want number, and they're Gaussian distributed with mean 0 and variance 1. And there will be things like 0 0.1, 0, minus 0 0.2, 0 0.6, and so on. You'll get a bunch of these numbers from your random number generator. If what you care about is a Gaussian that has mean 10 and variance 1, then all you do is you add 10 to each of these guys. Okay, and that's why I said you can just add the mean. So those are your uh, numbers. So uh, coming back, to why multiplying the three green bars is not something to get or anything else to get the maximum? Oh, because we're saying that the likelihood, the probability of y1 and y2 and y3, is the multiplication of p of y1 given theta times p of. No one warned me about this one. P of y2 given theta times p of y3 given theta. So it's those, those are the three bars that are multiplying. All right, so I've produced this data. Okay. This is not learning. For now, this is 10. I haven't done any learning. All I did was I generated data. If I have a model, a probability, I can generate data from a probabilistic model. Probabilities are nice because they allow us to do imagination. They allow us to hallucinate data. And in this case, I hallucinated um, a point here, a point here, a point here, and one over here. I generated these four data points. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. So I've generated those points. And now the question, now comes the learning problem. The learning problem is, I need to figure out what was this Gaussian. And then I can take many guesses. I could guess that it's this Gaussian here. Is that a good guess? That's not a good guess because the probability of the data under this Gaussian is just four tiny green bars. So what do I do? I'm going to move this Gaussian until that Gaussian is centered at the data. Because when that Gaussian is centered at the data, I'm going to have big green bars. Big numbers that were multiplied. So that's going to give me the highest product of those three green bars. And that's the maximum likelihood estimate. We're just moving that Gaussian left and right. There's many solutions for the Gaussian, but we're trying to find the one that gives us the green bars. Highest green bars, and so that's the one that actually is just covers the data. And, and that sort of makes sense because the true distribution was something that looked like this. This guy here, from which I generated data, was like this. And so maximum likely would just allow me to recover the original gas. Okay. That's sort of the fundamental <coughs> principle, how we, how we learn a distribution. And when we learn the variance, we'll just learn to squish it and expand it until it describes the data.
it tells us this data has this mean, the center, and the variance is the spread. So learning is about capturing the statistics of the data, understanding the statistics of the data. When we go to regression, the game changes now a little bit, but it's still in a way the same. The way it, in which it changes is that we no longer just have one variable, but we're given pairs of variables, inputs and outputs. Inputs X and output Y. Okay? And then what we're saying is the model that we're going to use is we're going to say that the data, the Y's, the heights, will be distributed according to a Gaussian. And that that Gaussian is going to have as the mean the line and it's going to have some variance from about that line. So essentially, I'm going to draw this soon. Actually, let me draw this. Uh, no, OK. Maybe not. So essentially, what we're going to say is that if we have a point, if we have a data point, this is x, the height is y, we're saying that each point is described by a Gaussian whose mean is x times theta, like this. So for each point there is a Gaussian, but the Gaussian is over y, is over the height. And the Gaussian is centered at x times theta, which is y i hat, which is the line. And then the variance is sigma squared. So for each point, what we're saying in, is that each point has mean x i theta, the input times the parameter. It has a variance sigma squared. And we're modeling y, the distributions of a y. We no, we're not assuming that X has noise here. In, in some statistical models, we do model the noise in the Xs, especially in medical questionnaires and so on. It's very important to model that. Um, but here, the model is over Y. We're saying that the noise is in Y. We're saying that there is no noise in the X. The Xs are observed. You always see the input. It's the Y that you're uncertain about. You're going to want to predict Ys not inputs. Okay, so we're going to see genes, we're going to measure genes, and we're going to try to predict whether someone will recover uh, from cancer or not. But the prediction is the recovery. We always get to observe the genes. What we don't know is whether the person recovers or not. The Y is the, the thing we want to predict. And the thetas are just the weights that's, that multiply each gene. Um, so we're not actually so much interested in the thetas. Typically, we're interested in the prediction. Sometimes we want to know which are the genes that are responsible for the person recovering, and that's when we introduce the L1 norm. Okay. Now, because I have more than one point, so I will have this point here, but I will have other points. Like I might have another point here. And such a point will also be distributed with a Gauss centered again at the line. Okay, so this will be my x, <coughs> my x1. So each point each point has a corresponding Gauss. If I want to know what's the uncertainty of the model, the assumption I will make is that all these points are independent of each other. <coughs> they sort of depend on th given, th but theta is given. So once you know theta, you can interpret these points as being independent. Okay. They share a theta. So the graphical model, as I mentioned, if you have <coughs> two points, you might have x1 and y1 and x2 and y2 
So you have two independent distributions, but you have a common theta. So you have common thetas, but these are factorized distributions. Because they are factorized, the joint distribution of this vector that's n by 1, recall that this is n by d, and this is d by 1. And then sigma is just 1 by 1. The joint distribution over the y's is just the individual products. Because I'm going to multiply each of these Gaussians. And that's why I did the previous exercise of multiplying 1D Gaussians. Because when I multiply 1D Gaussians, I will get one Gaussian in n dimensions. That's a multivariate Gaussian in n dimensions. And that's this probability that we have here. So you have variance as 1 in this example? Oh, no, in the previous example, I had variance as 1. Here, I'm setting it to an unknown. Here, the variance is unknown. And we will soon see how we can learn the variance. OK, so that's the setting. The, like, understanding that graph is the most important thing, actually. The rest is just mathematical trickery. Uh, but the intuition is that each variable has noise. And the noise is in the y. And then each variable is independent of the other. You know, I, I make a measurement about him, and then I drop him, and I go over there, and I make a measurement uh, about her or so. And the measurements are completely unrelated. They're completely uncorrelated. They're independent. OK, if they're independent, the probability is just a produ product of the individual probabilities using the independence uh, property. And then I know the equation of each of these Gaussians. Each of these Gaussians has mean xi times theta, okay, because they're centered on the line. And they're Gaussians for each of the y's. Each yi has one Gaussian. And each little Gaussian has the same variance, sigma squared. Okay, so I can write that probability there. I can then take, I can then use the property that a, uh, the product of a to the i is just equal to a to the sum of, um, hang on. Yeah, some of the i's, so to speak. Let me try to do it in a simpler way. A to the 2 times A to the 3 is equal to A to the 2 plus 3. If I have a product, of terms, which is what I have here, a product of these guys can be written as the guide to the number of times of the product. In this case, it's the same term, so the sum is just n times the number of individual terms. And so for this guy, I have the product of these guys, and I can just write as e to the sum. So I'm using the, basically the property that when I multiply terms to a power, it's just a term to the sum in the power. And that's essentially, now we put this in matrix form, just like we did before for linear regression. And what we have now is a multivariate Gaussian. It's a Gaussian in n dimensions. It's a diagonal covariance with sigma squared in the diagonal. So sigma. in this case is given like this. So it's a diagonal. And it's n by n. It's a huge gas. If you have a million points, this is a million dimensional gas. But it has a lot of structures. They're all independent. I just have a question regarding storage, because I asked this before as well. Mm -hmm. When you want to store something like sigma, 
just in terms of space requirements? Store the diagonal only. Just the diagonal. Yeah, because every other entry is zero, and you know that, so. And that's how the multivariate Gaussian arises. And so from now on, when I write the likelihood, I will just write a multivariate Gaussian. And that's mostly because it's, it allows me to do derivations much more easily. It, it, it's a lot of effort to work with this. Too many indices, easy to make mistakes, hard to code. Um, and then you use for loops instead of vectorized operations, which make the code slower. So it's always important to go to matrix notation. It, it takes a while to get used to it, but once you get used to it, you will never go back to doing indices. All right, so in conclusion, our probability pro is basically is this guy here. It's the product of individual probabilities, which we grouped in one single term as this. And then the picture is that picture that you saw, where you're just multiplying the individual probabilities. All right, that is the probability of the data. This is given. It's important. There is no uncertainty on this. This is given. This is a variable that's been given to us. This is a probability over y. The uncertainty is on y. It's the space here is the space of the y's. So distribution over the data. You can simulate data from it because it's a probability over data. We call it the likelihood. And the likelihood is essentially the probability of the data parametrized by some parameters. It's not a probability of a theta. Theta is just, say, the mean or the variance of that distribution. It's a distribution over the data, over the space of the data, the probability of the data. The more probable the data is, then the better the model is. If, 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 if you can predict the world, which is the data with high probability, that just means you have a probable model. You have a good model. And that's essentially what maximum likelihood is. This is the hard bit, is to formulate the model. Once you formulate the model, and for neural networks, it's exactly the same. We also put like Gaussians vertically. For all the complex models, it's always the same game. So once you understand this for the linear model, for all the other models, this is how we're going to use the same tricks. Once you have this, then we, let's go back to how we did maximum likelihood with the coin flips. We write the model. We take the log of that model. We differentiate, equate to 0, and solve for theta. And here we're going to do exactly the same thing. In this case, there are two parameters. So we're going to freeze sigma, and we're going to estimate theta, and then we're going to freeze, and then we're going to estimate one given the other. First, let's do the log. So the log likelihood of theta and sigma, sigma sigma squared, doesn't matter how you write, um, is equal to the log of this expression, which is minus n over 2, the log of 2 pi sigma squared. And because we always do the log of the likelihood, you probably have realized by now that knowing logs is important in machine learning. The properties of logs, log of a times b is log of a plus b. Um, good time to go to Wikipedia and revise those. Why is y conditioned on theta and sigma? Are they not parameters? They are parameters. Um, Should we say it is parameterized by them? Yes, that's correct. In, in a frequent setting, that's correct. Um, when we talk about Bayesian stats, I will come back to your question. Because there it's important to say condition. So that notation says that y is... Right now, this notation is excessive. We, we ju it would suffice to say that they're parameterized. When we do Bayesian statistics, it's gonna ch then, then we do need this notation. Let me come back to it later. Remind me when I do the base. And so I have this. And if I take the log of the second term, I just get minus 1 over 2. Uh, 2 sigma squared y minus x theta transpose y minus x theta. 
And that's mainly the reason why we take logs. Because probabilities always have these e's, these exponents, or these powers. And when we take logs, we get rid of that. And then the derivative becomes much easier. It's easier to differentiate in log space. Now I just need to compute the derivative of that. So if I want to get theta, okay, so I have this expression, let me write. If I just want theta, let's assume that I have sigma now. I just need to compute the derivative of this guy. The one thing that you should note already though is that this term here, this is the cost function for least squares. So a Gaussian simply has the least squares cost in the exponent. So if I take the log, I'm, I'm back to least squares. So probability is an exponent, some normalizing constant, the first term, <coughs> times an exponent, and then the power of that exponent is a cost function. So often, indeed, you can write probabilities will always be of the form um, some normalizing constant z, and then e to the minus some j function. Probabilities in general have that shape. That is that normalizing constant z, which in this case is this n over 2 log 2 pi sigma squared, and then which is what makes it integrate to 1. The first term does not depend on theta, z there does not depend on the parameter. And then there's the second term, which is the, the cost, the least squares cost in this case. Now if we differentiate with respect to if we differentiate L of theta with respect to theta in order to find the best theta, then that's just equal to minus 1 over 2 sigma squared. The derivative <coughs> with respect to theta of y minus x theta transpose y minus x theta. Okay, because the derivative of the first term is 0, because <coughs> it has no thetas. And this, in, in fact, is just what we did before. Again, this was the least squares. So if you can do the least squares, you can do this one too. And we already saw that this was equal to 1 minus 2 sigma squared. Using those rules of matrix differentiation, which I will give to you in the midterm if you need them, um, this is just what x transpose x theta uh, minus 2x transpose y um, and then when you equate to 0 you get theta equal to x transpose x minus 1 x transpose y. This is the theta maximum likelihood and it is precisely the same one as the theta least squares. So we haven't done anything. In a way, I've introduced all this probability, but I'm still getting the same answer. But all I'm trying to say is think of a cost function. There is a sort of mapping between cost functions and probabilities. Okay. Maximizing a probability that is, looks like a quadratic is the same as minimizing a cost function. However, I can then start doing a lot more. I can talk about the probability of sigma squared. And I'm not going to go over this one. I'm going to try to move on. Um, but again, if you do the derivative with respect to sigma squared, you just take the derivative. If you want to know the estimate of sigma squared, you take the derivative with respect to sigma, you equate to 0, and you get a formula for sigma. And that's the usual formula for the variance of the date. So we recover things that make sense. If you want to make a prediction, okay, so 
I'm given those four points. I learn with those four points. If I have a new point and I need to make a prediction, like let's assume that the new point is x star, then I just need to evaluate x star at the line. And the height of the line is just y hat. And so the prediction for y is just x star times theta. And it's the theta that I learned. So you have data, you learn theta. Once you have theta, given a new x, you can make a new prediction just by multiplying the new x times theta. And we also know more than just what the mean is. Because we learned what sigma is, we also now know the confidence. I can tell you that the, the chances of you, um, the chances, uh, no, the probability of your height being two meters is going to be let's say if, if x is height two and this is how good you play basketball then uh, I can say that if your height is equal to two meters, this is how good a basketball player you're going to be, I don't know, some number, a score of five, <coughs> plus or minus some variance. Probably a terrible example, but anyway, so if you have an input, you can predict an output. If you have a new, new properties of the house, like number of rooms, neighborhood, you can predict the price. So I, I learned from Kitsilano and then I move on to Fairview and I use my same variables like number of rooms, um, proximity to a good school, and from that I predict the price of the house. So here we are assuming that all y's have the same variance? That's correct. So that was a question that was asked earlier. Um, sometimes you can allow for them to have different variances. Now, how, what would you do? You just basically in your probabilistic model, you would introduce I haven't done that, but if you want the different variances, you would simply add an index to each of the sigmas, and then you compute the derivative with respect to each of those sigmas. Okay. And in fact, if you wanted to add some correlation in those sigmas, you could even use a full multivariate Gauss. But the procedure, no matter what your model was, no matter what, how it changed, <coughs> The procedure will always be the same. The log of it, differentiate, equate to zero. This is like the old like saying, that once you teach someone how to fish, they will just go and catch as many fish. This is the formula for fishing. Log, differentiate, equate to zero, so forth. Once you know how to do this, you will catch salmon and cod and all sorts of fish until we deplete the oceans. There was, no? So that's basically the probabilistic interpretation of this. And uh, I'm going to skip this. And now let's, but one of the problems with this, and someone pointed this out, uh, let's go back here. Someone pointed this out in a previous lecture. Is that here I'm computing x transpose x, a matrix, and I'm inverting that matrix. Now, x is n by d. So when I take x transpose x, that's d by d. I'm inverting a d by d matrix. Now, d is the number of inputs. Different. Now, if I'm doing the houses, then the inputs would be the number of rooms, proximity to a school, variables like that. So d by d would be like 5 by 5. Inverting the matrix is no big deal. If I'm doing genes, the number of inputs is 20,000, say. So now my matrix is 20,000 by 20,000. Inverting that matrix starts getting tricky. If I'm predicting whether the sentiment of Obama, on, according to Twitter feeds, is positive or negative, what I would do is I would look at all the words that appear in the tweets that mention Obama. I would construct a huge feature vector. 
that feature vector, if a word is present, that vector will have as many entries as words in English, and in fact, as words in Twitterish. So OMG will be there, and stuff like that. So you'll have that many, so you'll probably have a few million of these entries. Let's say you pick the most popular ones, you have a million entries. So now you, and then essentially those entries are one or a zero. It's a one if the word appears, if OMG appears you put a one, if it doesn't appear you put a zero, and you construct that vector. That matrix now is a million by a million. Good luck inverting that. In fact, I will give you that matrix very soon as part of the project, which I'm not going to talk about until next week, at the end of next week. But essentially, I'm going to ask you to predict the sentiment of tweets, to build a sentiment predictor from tweets. Um, and that, that's a project. And you'll all be able to do that. But if you do it the dumb way, if you try to invert that matrix, you'll be in trouble. <laughs>